All righty. <clears throat> Thank you. Have you looked at 1415? Very small, about three pages. Oh. Yeah, together, 1415. There are about three pages. So. You just want to I always plan ahead. I always yeah. Very good. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so let's finish up chapter 12 and start 13. Yep. We'll finish 12 and half of 13 today. We can actually have this earlier, actually. Not, maybe not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, before I start, those of you who are in lab, um, you can earn a few extra points in the lab um, by rewriting the principle of one of the lab experiments. <clears throat> okay. I just keep on forgetting in the lab. Um, Okay. Part B? Just two Five. 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 Just the individual. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, yeah, pick one experiment and rewrite the principle. Don't have to do the whole experiment. Just the principle, okay? Don't have to do the objective, the, the pr procedure and all. Just the principle. You can include diagrams if you want. Just make it easier for other students. Whatever you think will help the other students in the future, okay? Rewrite it. Just one experiment. Pick one experiment of your choice, okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, just one one experiment. So uh, you say principle, like, see the principle there, right? Just the principle. And just it has yep. to be all of this. this is just all of it. It has to be all of it. Not not yeah. one paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> and it, like, and information that we think you can delete it. You can completely rewrite it, but it has to be different than whatever it is in there. Not the same. It has to be completely different. Rewritten rewritten completely new principle okay. completely new new principle you just cannot give me this change a few typos and all that yeah <laughs> yeah Ramstein is very good one you can include I, would, I was go, to, go, going to do is include diagrams of gram positive cell wall gram negative cell wall okay it, that was my idea when I was going to rewrite that one okay um, so if we do that, that doesn't. No, no, no. You really. I mean, that's that's an idea. Whoever is going to do that, do that, please. Yeah. Uh, things like that. Okay. So that will make it easier. So just just the principal part for five points. Yeah. <coughs> when is it due? Before the class ends. Okay. Fine. All right. Yeah. Yep. Um, what if some of them are very complicated to try to simplify it a little bit? Sure. Okay. One is very complicated. For example, nitrate reduction coming up is complicated. Make it simple. Sure. Fungi is one of the very complicated <coughs> ones. Fungi. Make it easier. Fungi. Can make sure. Chart, flow chart. Easy. Make it easier. Simplify it. No problem. If it is 10 pages, 
make it two pages. No problem. No problem. Remember, I may take your suggestion. I may not. All right? Just yeah. fine. I don't have to. Just do your best. Okay? Good. Let's just get started now. <clears throat> Protozoan, second half of chapter 12. All right. Um, first half of protozoan is the same characteristics. The reason I did the second half, they changed the classification of protozoan uh, last year, I think, in the new edition of Tortora, chapter, I mean, uh, 11th edition, 10th edition. There's old classification. In the new edition, they have changed it. <clears throat> Protozoans are a group of uh, microorganisms that are unicellular protist. What's a protist? Protist. They protest a lot. <laughs> protest. They, been, they belong to the kingdom Protista. There are five kingdoms, right? Five major kingdoms. Kingdom number one, kingdom of God. <laughs> Monera. Monera, that includes bacteria and cyanobacteria. Kingdom number two, kingdom Protista. That includes animal-like and plant-like creatures. Protozoans. Protozoans. Three. <coughs> Fungi. When we say plant-like, mean they have characteristics of plant, but they do not have leaves. They do not have trunks. They do not have roots. But they are autotrophic. They can make their own food, like algae, autotrophic. Plant-like, they can make their um, plant-like, that they are, they can synthesize their, uh, they have, they can go through cellular respiration, but they do not have well-defined internal organs. They don't have digestive system, reproductive system, like, for example, um, protozoans, protozoans, okay, no internal organs, but they have characteristics of higher animals. They can move from one place to another, okay, but they don't have legs, okay, they don't have arms and they don't have eyes, stuff like that, but they have sensory organs, okay, they have mini brains like eye spots. They don't have eyes, okay? Things like that. So animal-like, plant-like, not fungi, protista. Oh, so protista is animal-like and plant-like, not yeah. animal. Yeah. Fungi are fungi, okay? Like three different types of, three major groups of fungi. Multicellular, two types, molds and yeast and third group. Fleshy fungi, fleshy, that store nutrients, large quantities of nutrients. Fourth group, plantae, higher plants. And last, that include us, animalia. Animalia, okay? Characteristics, all protozoans, they have two things in common, cytoplasmic body and at least one nucleus. There are protozoans that have more than one nucleus. Can you name at least one? Very good. Giardia lamblia. Yesterday I was wearing a tie with Giardia lamblia. You missed it, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Giardia lamblia or Bellantidium coli, B. coli, also has two nuclei. Uh, what else has two nuclei? Plasmodium vivax during the developmental stage, 
early schizont has two nuclei or four nuclei. Okay. Now, the point number three, I have to modify it a little bit. Uh, a few years ago, this was very true. In the, according to the new classification, this needs to be modified. Mostly aerobic heterotrophs, but many are capable of anaerobic growth. You have to add something. Some are, some, some are autotrophic. Some protozoans are autotrophic. I think I showed you one in the lab. Remember? I may have, I'm not sure if I showed it to all of you. Remember the euglena? That has chlorophyll in it? Euglena. So, some are autotrophic. It's kind of weird. Euglena is actually both autotrophic and heterotrophic. If you turn the light off, put it in the dark, it will start to use organic matter from the dish instead of making its own food. So it is both heterotrophic and autotrophic. Okay? This n did not change according to the new classification. Mode of locomotion remains the same. Pseudopods, amoeba, flagella. Okay. This they have put in two different categories. I don't see the reason why, but they have flagellates and cilia. Okay. All right. <coughs> Two terminologies here that are new. They're using them for the very first time. Binary fission, reproduction through binary fission that we already know. Multiple fission, if you have seen this, in the lab, remember after early schizon, late schizon, remember the term late schizon? That the proper term for late schizon or multiple fission is, underline this term please, schizogony. Once P vive X has fully matured, the RBC ruptures and a whole bunch of merozoites come out, right? A whole bunch of little merozoites come out, and that's called multiple fission. When one cell splits into many, uh, many cells, that's called multiple fission. Sexual reproduction. Yep. The same as the late schizon. Late schizon. Late schizon in P vivax. In P vivax. Sexual reproduction. This is another new term. Syngamy. Syngamy. Fusion of gametes. Like bacteria, when the conditions are unfavorable, they produce what? Endospore. There are some protozoans when the conditions are no good, they turn into a cyst. Cyst. But cysts are not as tough as endospores. Many endospores can survive boiling for, for several hours. But cysts, they can be destroyed by boiling very easily. So they are not as resistant as endospores. When both are being produced? Uh, but yeah, there are some protozoans that can produce cysts under adverse conditions. Where do you find endospore? I mean, where do you find protozoans? Wherever you have moisture, water, either fresh water or salt water. <coughs> A metabolically active protozoan is called trophozoit, and a metabolically inactive protozoan is called a cyst. Let me ask you this. Yeah. You go to a, a restaurant and you consume a burger that has cyst, and your friend consumes a burger that has trophozoit. Who is more likely to get the disease, you or your friend? Okay. The cyst, the person who consumed the cyst, because the acidity of the stomach will take care of the trophozoite. It will be destroyed, but the cyst will survive. It will go into the intestine. It will turn into a trophozoite. So the person who consumed the cyst is more likely to get the disease. Yeah. 
No. Yeah. If it is active, it is trophozoid. If it is yeah, inactive, it is cyst. So it, yeah. that's the same as would be a vegetative mm -hmm. and endospores. There exactly. are no endospores and protozoans. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this so-called exterminating? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Same same principle. Yeah. yeah. All right. Here's the new classification of protozoan. Okay. The the f old class flagellates, flagellata is no more. Okay. Instead of flagellata, the new group is called euglenozoa. Euglenozoa. Okay. Euglenozoa, they cannot reproduce sexually. Mitochondria like, uh, sh uh, they have a uh, dish-shaped mitochondria. And there are two subcategories of euglenozoa. One is called euglino, euglenoids. They are both. This is kind of unique. As I just mentioned to you, they are both phototrophs or photoautotrophs. But if you remove the light, they can also use organic food. So they are chemoheterotrophs. Okay. They have a plasma membrane, which also serves like a cell wall, semi-rigid cell membrane called pellicle. So their plasma membrane is like both cell wall and cell membrane called pellicle. Motile by means of flagella, and they have a mini brain, which is like an eye spot, which guides them which way to move. Okay, the base of the flagella, they have this. It's a red spot like a brain which guides them which direction to move. That's, pardon me? Eye spot. Eye spot is like a mini brain. Second group of euglenoids are those um, uh, protozoans that are found in the blood. Okay. Remember Trypanosoma gambinis? Okay. These are called hemoflagellates, heme from blood, blood parasites. And they are transmitted to animals from the bite of blood feeding insects. Okay. Their bodies are designed uh, in such a manner so they can move into the thick blood easily, cylindrical and with undulating membranes. Trypanosoma gambinese. African sleeping sickness, Trypanosoma cruzi, they're called Chagas disease. This lives in the mouth of kissing bug. Kissing bug. No, 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 not love bug. Love bug is different. Kissing bug. Kissing bug. <coughs> kissing bug. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? DC TC fly, not only ordinary fly, look full of blood. DC yeah. TC fly that sucks blood just like a mosquito. And transfers, yeah, that causes African sleeping sickness. Uh, no, that's a, no, no, no. Horsefly is completely different. Summer is coming, so you will be warned of this mosquito. This is Culax mosquito. Culax that carries a virus called arbovirus, which can cause encephalitis, inflammation of the membranes of the brain. This is in Florida. Yep. So when they spray and they for the mosquitoes, yeah. Is that really actually effective? Yes, it is. Yeah, it kills the larvae, larvae, yeah, yeah. Is um, encephalitis as, or is the TC sleep African sleeping sickness as rare as encephalitis? Oh, it's not in, in, in America. No, but yeah. over there, is it as rare or is it? It's very common, very common, yep, yep, common. And here is the number one infectious disease in the world, which is, which is, 
about 300 to 500 million new cases every year. 300 million to 500 million new cases every year. Malaria. And this is the baby that causes it. This is the female Anopheles mosquito. Female Anopheles mosquito that causes it. And this is common in the, the Midwest and the northern states. Oh, sorry, this one. What is it? Not only, not just the tick, deer tick. Female, male, larvae, and nymph. Pardon me? Ixodus. Ixodus. Not, yeah, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. It carries a, a gram negative bacterium it's in, in its mouth called Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, Borreliosis. Uh, yep, so let's move on back. Here is the one that we were talking about right here. This is our Euglena right here. Eye spot is really not that good here. Uh, Trichomonas vaginalis. This is the undulating membrane we were talking about that helps these organisms to move in the blood. That's Giardia lamblia. Okay. Hmm. That's actually, that's, yeah. this is very nice. You see right here? This is the actual picture. That's the diagram. That's the brain. That's the flagella right there. Yep. Okay. Fine. Okay. <clears throat> Trichomonas vaginalis, okay, although it's called vaginalis, both male and female get it, okay. If one partner is diagnosed with trichomonas vaginalis, both are treated, okay. Second group, okay, after euglenoid is amoebae. My question is, what's, what's wrong with sarcodyna? Why call it amoebae? Okay, remember the old group, sarcodyna, that included amoebas? Now they call it amoebae. Okay, fine. <laughs> what was wrong with this? Okay, sarcodyna. So amoebae, it includes amoebas. Fine, all right. Nothing else has changed. They have moved with the help of pseudopods. Okay. About 10% of, of the world population, they carry this pathogen. By the way, this is the only human pathogen. Uh, Others are non-human pathogen, Antamoeba solitica, okay, that causes amoebic dysentery. This is the one that is non-pathogenic that is found in, uh, this is very common in uh, freshwater uh, ponds and lakes. I think this is the one that killed the kid in Pompano. This crawled through the nose, went to his brain and caused the uh, encephalitis. Brain abscesses, Bellamuthia, non-parasitic amoeba. Okay. Like non-parasitic or non-pathogenic? Non-parasitic, non-pathogenic. But it can cause even non-pathogenic, non-parasitic, if it ends up in the wrong part of the body. For example, E. coli, it's non-pathogenic. But if it ends up in your own bladder, it can cause UTI. E. coli in your brain can cause encephalitis because remember your McConkey agar plate, E. coli on McConkey, how much acid it makes, remember pink halo, our intestine can take care of that much acid, but the brain cannot get rid of that much acid. So in the wrong part of the body, even a non-pathogenic bacteria can cause havoc. Ooh, remember that plate, McConkey agar plate with pink halo? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. But, but 
if it ends up in the brain, oh, wow, yeah, in the wrong part. That's why it is, yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. It, right. If it ends up in the wrong part of the body, it can cause big problems. That's why it's considered opportunistic pathogen. In the wrong part of the body, big, big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Remember there was a lady in Coral Spring who was adding fecal material to her own daughter's feeding tube. Barbara, yeah. Muchhauser syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, breath oxy, yeah. All right, ciliates. This was the group that they left alone. Ciliate, ciliata, okay. Move with the help of cilia. Only one member from this group is human pathogen, Ballantidium coli, severe dysentery. Last one, old, remember old sporozoa? Cannot move their own on their own. The new name for this group is epicomplexia. I don't know what kind of complex they had, but <laughs> look, look. <laughs> epicomplexia. <laughs> Characteristics remain same, but nothing has changed, just the name. Non-motile in their mature form, obligate intracellular parasite, life cycle involves several hosts. One example, remember plasmodium? How many uh, hosts for plasmodium? Two, and those two hosts are? Mosquito? Not only you know, any mosquito, female Anopheles mosquito, and human. Yeah. This number I just gave you, 300 to 500 million new cases every year. Number one, infectious disease in the world. Okay. Uh, no vaccine. Okay. Because n new strains, just like cold virus, it changes so much. That's why we don't have any effective vaccine against Plasmodium. Toxoplasma gun die. Causes toxoplasmosis. How do we get it? Cat feces. Cryptococcus, cryptosporidium, uh, another uh, intracellular parasite that we get through drinking contaminated water. Okay, severe diarrhea. Pictures. Last topic of this chapter 12, arthropods. What are arthropods? Joint-footed insects. Insects that have joints in their legs. Joints, joint, 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 joint-footed insects. So we're not talking about the diseases that are caused by those arthropods, because there are diseases that are caused by in insects. For example, scabies, there's the insect crawls under your skin, scabies, skin disease. We're not talking about that. We're talking about these arthropods as carriers of pathogens that cause disease. For example, this deer tick, Ixodes, carries this organism pathogen that causes Lyme disease. If your child is sent home from school, there's a reason for that because this um, Lice, it carries gram-negative bacteria that can cause nasty fever, typhus fever, epidemic typhus fever. Female Anopheles mosquito, okay? Only females carry this. b vivax causes malaria. Culex, both male and female mosquitoes. They carry this virus called arbovirus, which causes encephalitis. A couple of people always die in Florida every year, always. And then TCTC fly, okay, carries T. gambonese, which causes African sleeping sickness. Animals, including humans, are susceptible to African sleeping sickness. Cows, camels, horses, humans, they're all susceptible to that, okay? This is the end of chapter number 12. Now we start chapter number 13. <coughs> Viruses. Oh.
Okay. All living cells, a cell is made up of at least three things, cell membrane, cytoplasm, and nuclear material. A virus is made up of only two things, two things, a protein coat and nucleic acid, a protein coat and nucleic acid either DNA or RNA, never both. That's one thing that differentiates or separates living cells from viruses. Living cells, they always have DNA and RNA both. Living cells, they always have DNA and RNA both. Okay? You cannot have a living cell without either DNA or RNA, you must have both in, in, in a living cell. But viruses DNA and RNA, they have either DNA or RNA, okay? And secondly, they need a living host to grow. Any host? Randomly? No, okay? Have you ever heard hepatitis virus enter into a host? and started to infect the brain of that person. True? Never. Liver. Okay. HIV entered into a host and they started to infect the heart of that person. No. What type of cell? Only, not only T cells, T4 cell, not T8 cell, not TS cell, not T, yeah, any T cell, T4 cell. Okay. Specific type of cell. Okay? We are going to go into the detail of those later. Okay? This is the gentleman who first isolated viruses. He was not able to see them. There was no good quality microscope, not even good quality compound microscope. No electron, but no even good quality compound microscopes. But he isolated viruses. How? He was a botanist. He was working on tobacco leaves tobacco plants, okay? So what he noticed that he will grow his tobacco plants, okay? And then the tobacco plants will turn brown and eventually they will die. So he will take his dead tobacco plants, put them in a blender along with some sterile water, and after that he will filter them through a filter paper, okay? Take the filtrate, okay, and streak them on a petri dish, incubate them, nothing will grow. He will take the filtrate, spray them on fresh, healthy tobacco plants. Plants will die. He repeated this several times. He was very confused that nothing is growing on the petri dish, but at the same time, the fresh plants will keep on dying. So he concluded that there is something in this liquid that is killing my plants but nothing is growing on a petri dish. So he simply called that liquid what? Contagium vivum fluidum. A living infectious fluid. He knew there's something in there that's killing it. But there's, not, there's nothing growing on the petri dish. So this concept of this fluid is embodied in the word virus, which means poison. The term virus came much later. He didn't call it virus. He didn't know what that is. Okay. So we were able to see it for the very first time with the discovery of electron microscope. Okay. What makes, uh, why are viruses unique in the field of microbiology? What makes them so unique? Number one, they have no meta metabolism of their own. But there are some viruses that have a few enzymes of their own. They do have some enzymes. 
where did they get them? Host. They multiply in the host. Before they leave the host, they pick up some enzyme from the host, then they leave. Why? They do. Um, reverse, yes, yep. They pick up the enzyme. They use the host enzyme, actually. They don't have the, uh, they make it while they're inside the host. Yeah, that, that, that's right. But the HIV virus is an RNA virus. It's a virus. Yeah. It's inside the host cell, it transfers into the DNA. Yes. 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 So they use they use that enzyme while they are inside the host. But they why do they need this enzyme? They pack some of the enzyme in their protein jacket. They use this enzyme to penetrate into the host. Okay? Yeah. So some of the viruses they have the enzyme. They use this enzyme to attack or penetrate into the new host. Okay? No motility, they have no means of locomotion, <laughs> cannot grow on artificial media, and that's why Koch postulates needs to be modified. According to the Koch, you need to be able to grow your pathogen on a lab media, okay? And viruses don't. Because they have no metabolism of their own, viruses do not respond to stimuli in their environment. Okay. Host range, meaning, which, how do we know which virus will infect or attach to which cell? Two major factors determine that. Two. La, la, la. Presence of receptors, or you can say in parentheses, presence of antigens, antigens on the surface of the cell. Every cell has specific antigens on their surface. If the antigen is present, whoop, the virus will bind, okay? Once the virus is attached to that antigen, now the, the cell must be able to provide enzymes, nutrients, and other requirements that the virus needs to multiply. On the basis of these two factors, almost all viruses are divided into three major groups. And they do not cross boundaries. Animal viruses, plant viruses, and bacterial viruses. Within groups, like a chimp virus may infect human virus. A pig virus may infect a human virus. That's possible, but you will never have an animal virus starting to infect a plant virus. You will never have a bacteria virus. There are viruses in our intestine, okay, that are infecting E. coli. All of a sudden, starting to infect your intestine it will never happen because the antigens that are found on the surface of bacteria that are not found on plants. Plant antigens are not found on animals. Okay, so they do not cross boundaries. Size of the viruses. <coughs> Range, diameter from 20 to 450 nanometers. Length could be from 20 to 14,000. Okay. One of the longest is Ebola virus, largest animal viruses. Ebola, I'll show you a diagram, the, the diagrams in a minute. You need an electron microscope to see most of the viruses, but there are some, some huge viruses. That if you have a good quality uh, compound microscope, you can see some of the large viruses under good quality uh, compound microscope. The smallest animal virus, you need to add the word animal right here, the smallest animal virus is polio, which is about 20 nanometer in diameter. And here is the diagram that's in your textbook. 
here's the Ebola virus. Look at this, the size of this thing. There is no cure for this thing. The person dies in about 10 days. Every, the person bleeds from every orifice of their body, ear, nose, eyes, and the person is about dead in 10 days. Um, there has been a few epidemics of that in some African countries. Okay. The, the, the person produces antibodies, but no cure, no pain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is very scary. Um, this is the virus that Dmitry Avanovsky was working with, tobacco mosaic virus. Okay. It says 30 here, but you will be tested on 20 in my notes. I just told you it's 20, so disregard this number. Polio virus is 20. Okay. Look at this right here, spaceship. That's a bacterial virus. There is a reason for that's why there are so many parts and why complex. Look at this bullet shape right here. That's the rabies virus right there, bullet shape. Human RBC, look at this how humongous, 10,000 nanometer. Here's our E. coli, bacterial, bacterium, 3,000 times 1,000. This is one of the largest human virus too, 300 times 200 times 100. Okay, prion, mad cow disease, not a virus, protein, particle of protein. Okay, no DNA, no RNA, just particle of protein. Okay, how do you grow them? Can't, no DNA, no RNA, so they cannot be cultivated at all. Okay, chlamydia, number one STD in the United States right here. Why is it here? It's a parasite, just like this is a bacterium, but because this is a, a parasite, it, like virus, it needs a living tissue to grow. Parasite. All of these are parasites. It's no, except for? E. coli. E. coli is not a parasite. Yep. Size-wise, No, no, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It is, because it's 300 nanometer. It is. Yeah, it is. It's small. Yeah. 300 nanometer. And the uh, mad cow disease, I'm not... Mad cow disease is caused by prion. You said a protein. It's, it's a particle of protein, yeah. It's not a virus. It's not a virus, it's not a virus but is it a, it's a parasite? It's not a parasite, no. It's in, it, in its category in its own. You cannot cultivate it, yep. So where does it come it, from? Yeah, where, if it can't grow, how do you... There are different schools of thoughts. Most scientists believe that the person makes its own prions, abnormal physiology. Okay. But, but if you consume uh, cow's brain okay, or contaminated meat, okay, the chances are you, you can get it. It has been diagnosed, it has been recovered from uh, people who have Alzheimer's disease in the blood of that. So people, yeah, scientists think that the people make their own prions. Or sometimes aliens come at nighttime and they, I'm just, <laughs> no, no, no. Prions, yep, yep. Alzheimer's, yeah. Right. Um, <coughs> incubation period of prions in humans is 15 years, and by the time they find out the person has it, the brain turns holy. Literally, holy means they have holes in their brain. When they do the autopsy, the brain is gone. It turns into spongy form brain, sponge holes. Yeah. Uh, in the early stages of early stages of Alzheimer's, they have found traces of prions, so they think it may be a reason. Prions may be the reason for that. Yeah. How would you find this other than having some type of a brain scan? Is that the only way? That yeah, there is no test for prions. Yeah, that's why they burn hundreds and thousands of cows in England. Yeah. Yeah. At one time, there was a, it was common practice to 
take the, the brain and the spines and the other parts of the cows, grind them and turn them into pellets of food and feed it to the in the United States. They have stopped that practice for the past several years now. Uh, traces of prions, the uh, particles of proteins. They can find it when it's yes. blood? Yes. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So there is no into the food market? Now there is. Now there is. But remember, still in the United States, I told you, uh, we still allow human feces to be added to the chicken food. Feces yeah. farming. Feces farming, yeah. Now one question and then we'll move on. Please. Rhinovirus is that causes uh, uh, nasal infection. Yeah, nasal infections. Yeah. How many polio viruses can infect E. coli? Approximately, polio is 20 nanometer. E. coli is 3,000 times 1, 1,000 nanometer. So, approximately, how many polio can infect E. coli? Yeah, look at the size, 10,000, 10,000, I have one answer, 10,000, 100, million, all right, all right, don't get upset, okay. all right, all right, no problem, 20, okay, let me move on. Answer is zero, animal, bacteria, all right, all right, okay, okay. I still got you for a few more weeks, so, okay, all right, all right. Viral structure, all right. <clears throat> infectious viral particle. What is infectious viral particle, which is also called a virion, is made up of two things. Nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, and a protein jacket, which is called capsid. Sometime it is also called nucleocapsid, okay. Let me, sh I need to show you a a diagram to explain what is infectious viral particle. It's a nucleo capsid. Nucleo capsid. Nucleo. Yeah, nucleo capsid. Seven. Nucleo capsid. Here we go. On page 382, if you have the book. Infectious viral particle, that's what I'm trying to explain. What is infectious viral particle? Here's a virus, bacterial virus, bacteriophage, infects the bacterium. Nucleic acid is being injected into the bacterium and the virus starts to multiply, okay? As you can see, all the parts are made separately, the head, the tail, the fibers right here, okay? Now something goes wrong and the host cell, the bacterium, dies. The cell wall breaks. All the parts that are being made, they are released. Can these parts infect other bacteria? Yeah, isn't that for that? Okay. 
All the parts are being made. The head is made, the tail is made, all the parts are made. Can they infect other cells? Okay, let me ask you this. Here is a, you're trying to assemble a car, the engine is made, the tires are made, the windshield is made, can you drive this car? No. It needs to be fully assembled in order to drive. So these are non-infectious particles. In order for a virus to infect other bacteria, it needs to be fully assembled. These are infectious particles. A fully infectious particle is a fully, assemb fully assembled virus. If the parts, you see this, this is a nice diagram. Did you see all these parts right here? If these parts are not assembled together, they cannot. Up to here, even right here, you see all these parts right here? The tires are not there. Can you drive it? No. If it is not fully assembled, you cannot drive this. This is a non-infectious particle. So a fully assembled virus is a fully, um, no, fu a fully infectious particle virus is fully assembled virus, okay? Then it is infectious particle. If it is not as fully assembled, it is non-infectious. So that's what it means. An infectious viral particle is fully assembled virus, a virion, okay? All right. Now, different types of nucleic acids. <clears throat> Living cells, they always have double-stranded circular DNA. But in viruses, look at the structure of nucleic acid. DNA. No living cell has single standard circular DNA. Now these examples that I'm giving you, the first four examples are for FYI. You don't have to memorize them. This, 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 this is all FYI. This is FYI. This is the only one you need to memorize. RNA double stranded. RNA double-stranded linear. You know why you need to memorize that? Because that is HIV. Double-stranded linear, retrovirus. Retro means? Backward. It is RNA. When it goes inside the cell, it makes DNA. I believe so. I believe not 100% here. Yeah. Double-stranded RNA goes inside the host and makes Now let's look at the different types of capsids and envelope. Capsid, all viruses have a capsid. But like some bacteria, in addition to the cell wall, they have a capsule, right? There are some viruses, they have an additional layer called envelope. Go ahead, David. No, no, uh-uh. Capsid, which is also called nucleocapsid, because it surrounds what? Nucleic acid. Composed of protein subunits called capsomeres. Some capsids are made up of only one type of protein. Others may, may be made up of many types of proteins. Many viruses, they have an additional layer called envelope, which is made up of the other additional organic compounds like proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates, which is external to the nucleocapsid. If the virus does not have an envelope, it is called naked virus or non-enveloped virus. Now, in addition to envelope, some viruses are covered with small hair-like projection, like some bacteria, they have hair-like projection that are called, what? Fimbri. 
fimbri in bacteria they have fimbri but in viruses they have spikes okay here's the capsid here's capsid and each little dot that you see little circle blue circle what would you call that building block capsid and the building block of the capsid is capsomere capsomere by the way this is poliovirus poliovirus different types I'll give you the names later this is Ebola virus right here what is inside worms right here yeah nucleic acid here right there nucleic acid you see right here in the middle capsid DNA this yellow jacket is what envelope and the green dots spikes spikes squirrely yeah little worm like things right there worm. Uh, spikes, yeah, they help bacteria, just like what fimbri do. Fimbri help the bacteria attach. They also help virus attach to the, yeah, here are the functions right here. Chemical composition of the spikes, carbohydrate and protein. So, and because they are carbohydrate and protein, they can be used as means of identification. In parentheses, you can write down because they are antigenic in nature. They are antigenic in nature, so they can be used as means of identification. They help viruses attached to the host. very specific yeah not even two viruses they have identical um, they will attach okay they are specific to each uh, virus but they are non specific to rbc's if a virus has spikes, all spikes will help virus attached to RBC. Okay. If a virus with spikes will end up in blood, all viruses will virus all viruses with spikes will cause hemagglutination clumping, because all spikes will attach to RBC. It, they have common site for RBC. Okay. But they, not all viruses will bind to the same antibody. They will bind to a different antibody. Clumping. Yeah. Hemagglutination. But that's a, yeah. but they only will buy, they will only cause damage and I don't want to They will all cause clumping. They'll all attach to RBC regardless of what any virus that has spike if it ends up in blood it will cause clumping yep the, the blood has to have a specific receptor yes spike. correct all RBCs they have receptors yeah. for yeah. for spikes so any virus that has spikes will cause clumping Hemagglutination. <coughs> Once it gets into your bloodstream, any of these viruses, then it gets carried on and then does there attaches to wherever it needs to attach after that or to cause I'm a little bit confused here. Mm, not sure why. What was the question? No. Any virus that has uh, spikes if it ends up in blood it will cause clumping
by structure that will bind to the specific receptor, like with HIV. That's what, yeah. The, the, those spikes are called uh, GP glycoprotein something with the number, and they have a specific receptor in the CD4, which those receptors are not present in any other cells or even immune cells. So, unless the specific receptor is present for those specific spikes, they cannot cause infection. They get into the blood and they can't cause the infection. That's the question. You said they all go into the, they all attach to RBC. They do. Necessarily cause an infection unless it attaches to the part. The re all viruses that have <laughs> spikes, they cause hemagglutination. Okay. Yep. Yes. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to talk against it, in, uh, but <coughs> HIV has spikes, envelope spikes. Yes. But it doesn't infect red blood cells. It's a, it's a, the spikes are those glycoproteins. They are specific for CD4. So under this definition, that doesn't fit. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that I cannot explain. Yeah. I cannot explain that. You're, you know, she's absolutely right. So let me find out. Yeah. She had to leave early. It's not my answer. That has nothing to do with <laughs> She had to. <laughs> she, yeah. Uh, Fozzie, let me find out. You're right. I mean, yeah. Because I studied the genetics a long time ago, HIV, very in detail. And one of the let me find, yeah, let me try to find out, or, yeah, you're absolutely right, yeah, yeah it says it does, but, yeah, you're absolutely right, I, I just think of that, that HIV does have spikes, and it does not bind to uh, RBCs, it does not, yeah, you're absolutely right, yeah, let's move on, and let me see if I can find out, really, you are absolutely right, yeah, okay, <clears throat> email me, please, because if, when I leave this room, Email me, please, okay? Yeah, remind me. Okay. <clears throat> How much time I have? Five? Eight. Okay. Who said five? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, f on the basis of structure of viruses, we can classify them into four major groups. Okay. Starting with polyhedral or many sided viruses. First one is polyhedral. Poliovirus, one specific example is icusahedron that has 20 faces and 12 corners. Poliovirus is a good example. It looks like a diamond. Capsomere, nucleic acid inside it. This is just memorization. Oh, this test, as I said, will have uh, pictures. So um, I'll give you a um, handout of these diagrams, okay? Helical, tobacco mosaic. It's like if you take a, um, a necklace made up of pearls and a pencil, wrap around the necklace made up of pearls on a pencil, remove the pencil, and you have a, a uh, coil, yeah, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Hollow coil, and inside, these are, this is the nucleic acid, the red pearls are nu uh, nucleic acid, and each little pearl is what? Capsomere, capsomere, building block, okay? Yeah. Enveloped, okay. Envelope, I'm going to draw my own. Yeah, this is, um, this is HIV, okay. Uh, capsid, er, what? No, sorry. This is capsid, the uh, little polyhedral, the black layer is capsid, the red is envelope, blue is envelope, and these are capsomeres. I'm um, no, not capsomere, sorry, spikes, blue spikes. Um, I will draw my own.
envelope could be polyhedral. This is envelope polyhedral. This is helical poly enveloped. Doesn't matter how you draw it, really. What is this? Yeah, non envelope or naked polyhedral, naked helical, enveloped helical, enveloped polyhedral. Yep. <clears throat> and the last category, then we will stop. No, then we will not stop, we will continue. Okay. <laughs> Is, yeah, complex. And you will see why they are complex. These are, they have capsid symmetry, that is neither icosahedral nor helical. They, are, they possess tail, other structure that are complex. Bacterial viruses, they have structure like this. And look at this one. Complex? Definitely complex. Okay. And this is the actual electron micrograph. They look like aliens have just landed on moon, right? Look at this. Okay. And this is not just for show. Each part of this bacteriophage has a specific function. Okay. Each part of the go ahead. Right here? Yeah. That's actually the nucleic acid that's being injected into the bacteria. The virus actually that never goes through the bacteria because bacteria have a rigid cell wall. So only, you see this mechanism right here? Right here? This mechanism is used to inject the nucleic acid into the bacteria. This is a little spring right here. That, yeah, this pin just holds this, this provides the pressure. This contracts and this is a needle right here that penetrates through the cell wall right here. It's like a spring giving a shot, okay? Giving a shot to the bacteria of the nucleic acid. Contraction takes place and the needle right here goes right through the cell wall of the bacteria. It's just amazing. It's just mind boggling what these little things can do. Uh, no, no breaking off, just it, it just retracts back and this empty head is left outside. Only the nucleic acid goes into the bacteria and this whole body is left outside. That's it. It just disintegrates. It has done its job. Only you need the nucleic acid which starts to replicate inside the bacteria then. Yep. Okay. Two possibilities. Once the nucleic acid inside the host, the DNA may become part of the host and the bacteria may not die. Or it starts, there are two, yep, yeah, let's see. <sighs> Let me show you this, which we'll talk about next time, but there are two possibilities, okay? Here are the two possibilities. Yeah, here. The DNA goes in. Here's the dead body right here, empty body. So the DNA, okay, goes in, it starts to multiply, and the cell dies. Or the DNA may become part of the host, and the host and the bacteria, the, the virus and the DNA, they live together. Exactly, exactly. Carrier or lytic. If the virus starts to multiply, the host is dead. If this does not multiply, you're okay. Carrier, carrier phase. Yep. So even with this state of lysogenic entropy, this is a nanotech, if it has the real nucleus of the virus, it will be. You're infectious, yeah, you are infectious right here. Yeah, but, but the, on lysogenic, from the previous lectures, yep. there was another possibility that the phage would replicate and take the uh, copy of the host. <coughs> 
Yeah. So in that case, they will be carrying basically the quick acid from the host. Yes, so yeah. absolutely. So it's the lysogenic, but it cannot be infectious, right? Because it doesn't have the viral DNA. It has the host DNA. It has viral DNA. It has the viral DNA right here in the form of prophage. It has viral DNA. Yeah. It has phage, but it has become part of the host DNA right here. Yeah, it is carrier. It is infectious, but it is quiet. At some time, something may trigger to, to separate, and it may go this way or it may go this way. Yeah. How much time? I like it when someone says four, someone says five. Okay. Okay, yeah, this is the end actually of my notes, so let's just stop. Good day. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Ebola? Ebola. Um, from air, airborne. Air? Airborne, yeah. Mm -hmm.